you'll remember, uh, talked, uh, I talked somewhat about why is the Apostle Paul hated so much? Why is there so much animosity toward him? And uh, this morning we'll move quickly through some of this material. Uh, there's so much to cover and uh, so little time to do it. But uh, I think that it's absolutely necessary that we cover some of this information and, and get it out to you. So uh, I'm going to do that this morning. I'm going to get into it. Uh, for, quickly, I'm going to run through the religion of the Antichrist, in case you weren't here. Uh, the religion of the Antichrist, if you'll find Revelation 13, the Apocalypse, chapter 13, and uh, uh, Revelation chapter number 13, verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast. He is the second beast, or the false prophet, that points uh, worship toward the Antichrist, the pseudo Christos, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and it causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I want you to notice now, worship is absolutely a part of what's going on here when we're dealing with the Antichrist and with the, uh, the end times. Worship is a big deal. And if you remember when Satan showed up and confronted our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, if you will just fall down and worship me, all of this can be yours. Satan desires worship. Ezekiel 28 said he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was in an exalted position. Every indication is that the position Satan had in Ezekiel 28 was far above everything except possibly the archangel Michael and Gabriel. So worship is part of the Antichrist agenda for the end times. And here, here are the five elements involved in the religion of the Antichrist. A universal religion bringing them all together. A deeply spiritual religion. And I might mention what I'm at this. I've just recently begun to dig into this uh, Hadron Collider at CERN, Switzerland. And uh, uh, this uh, Brother Valence had mentioned that to me. He's mentioned to it a number of times. And it takes me a while, folks, to get off of one thing and get on to another. Uh, but I've been reading this past week. There's a lot of information available about this collider. Now, what's a collider? It's a huge thing that forces, they I think understand they use magnets, it forces things together that is not normal, but when it forces them together at the very moment that they come together, they are measuring what takes place. And they have discovered that some stuff's going on that blows their mind. It was the Higgs boson uh, particle that they discovered the last time when they got into this collider. And they called it the God particle. The bottom line is that they believe that this collision that takes place in this collider is going to open up a new dimension, an entirely new dimension that uh, will open up, of course, when it does, a completely different view of the universe and of, and of and physical creation and the, things that we under, and the way we understand things today. Some of them believe that it's possible that they could open up a portal a portal into another existence. That's the only way I know to put it. And this, this place over there at CERN, Switzerland, I haven't had time to do a lot of work on it, but the place at CERN, Switzerland, has a huge round, uh, a Hindu, huge round Hindu uh, goddess. And it's an amazing thing to me at how these men who profess to be, and they are no doubt scientists, no question about that, but why the connection with the Hindu religion? Why the connection with religion? What's the point in the connection with religion? See what I'm saying? There's a connection here. There's something going on that's, uh, that, that moves past the surface. So this religion of the Antichrist will be a deeply spiritual religion. It will be a possible connection with aliens. We've talked about that at length, the UFO phenomenon. UFOs are real, folks. They're just not what people think they are. And then the possible connection with the bloodline. We talked about that at length, about the Merovingian bloodline, the priory of Sion that was, that's here to, uh, to protect and propagate that bloodline from generation to generation. Dan Brown made millions of dollars uh, writing his book on the uh, Da Vinci Code 
And when he did this, he introduced people to something altogether new, and people love something new. He introduced them to, a, to something new, and the thesis of his book is that there is a bloodline that, uh, that, is, uh, that is here today that is a product of, of the union of the Lord Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, and the child or children that was born of them who become the, uh, the qualified heirs of the kingdoms of the world which of course is pure blasphemy. But anyway, the, uh, the idea of a possible connection with the bloodline. Then the Abrahamic religion, that's a religion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jew, and the faith of Christ, us. We are connected with the Abrahamic religion, folks, lock, stock, and barrel. Were it not for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there would be no Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel you have in your hands is a product of Jews who wrote the Old Testament. To them was given the oracles of God, Romans chapter number 9. And the New Testament Scripture was written by Jews. And the only exception, the only possible exception, you can't prove it one way or another, is Luke. And we're not even sure of that. But we do know that the, New, the Bible, for the most part, was written by Jews. To them given the oracles of God, that's what you have in your hand. So therefore it stands to reason that if you can demonize Jews, then you'll demonize the Bible. And that's exactly what they're doing. Their method, the method of the Antichrist, folks, is to undermine the foundations that people are accustomed to, put doubt in their mind, and then give them an alternative. And the alternative will always lead away from the truth. And there's only one truth, and it's a person. Amen. And everything else as it relates to him, uh, whatever element of truth it may have in it, it may it, we, we, we agree with that. But the truth is the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So the assault on the Apostle Paul, and let me give you probably one of the most sinister reasons for the assault on the Apostle Paul. Why do they assault him? Why do they say that this man uh, was a... As Thomas Jefferson in his Jefferson Bible, how many are aware of the Jefferson Bible? How many's never heard of it before in your life? Raise your hand. Never heard of the Jefferson Bible. They're not going to teach you in school, believe me. You will not get this in school. Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant man. He's one of the founding fathers of our nation. I'm not up here this morning to run Thomas Jefferson down one bit, but I'm here to give him as an illustration of what's going on. Thomas Jefferson took the New Testament and cut vast portions of it out because he didn't believe that it represented Christ as he understood him to be. And so therefore the product was the Jefferson Bible. The Jefferson Bible stayed in the hands of the family for a long time and then eventually showed up sometime, I think it was, in the latter part of the 1800s. But Thomas Jefferson said this about the Apostle Paul. He said he was one of the worst corrupters of the Christian religion. He called him a corrupter of the Christian religion. That's what he said about Paul. Thomas Jefferson is not alone in his criticism. All you have to do is a Google search and you'll find out there are many detractors of the Apostle Paul who do not believe he had any business writing Scripture. They believe that he was a usurper, that he was an interloper, that he came in when he shouldn't have been there, that Matthias was chosen in Acts 1 to take the place of, of Judas Iscariot. So they hate Paul. Let me give you one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons I believe that they hate the Apostle Paul. Paul tells you plainly in the New Testament what is going to happen to the Jew. He makes it very clear. And the Jews have suffered at the hands, folks, of people for generations. All you have to do is a little reading back in history and you'll find a thing called blood libel. How many ever heard of blood libel? The Europeans accused Jews of stealing their children, taking them off into the forest, and drinking their blood with matzo balls in sacrifice unto their God. They accused the Jews, therefore, of, 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 uh, of killing little children. And uh, when you get this kind of a, uh, an attack on someone, then you've demonized that person. And when Alfred Rosenberg, you remember I told you last week, he was the minister of, of uh, religious propaganda, uh, philosophy. Uh, Goebbels was the political, uh, the, uh, political uh, voice of, of, uh, of Nazi Germany. But Alfred Rosenberg was the spiritual voice of Nazi Germany. And uh, he, uh, he wrote his book on uh, tracking the Jew through time or through the ages. And he bought completely into the idea that the Jew 
is the accursed crowd that is to be blamed for all of the problems of mankind. Now, when you get to the idea that a race of people like that, the Jew, if you can blame, make them the boogeyman, and blame them for everything, then you've got a problem. You've got a big problem. But because the Bible said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's like today, for example. The masses of people are following. No doubt in my mind, they're brainwashed. They're following the, the, uh, the dictates of the higher-ups, the elite, the ones they call the super-rich. For example, uh, uh, Edith Starr, Edith, uh, uh, what was her name? Edith Starr, she wrote, uh, the, uh, she wrote a, she wrote a uh, treatise about, in the first part of the, of the 1900s, about the about the about this bloodline, about these elite, about these people who these super rich, who are uh, who are controlling the world, and that's what's happening today. They're controlling the world, and she published that thing, and a year later she was dead, and uh, she was 45 years old, and I think she died in France. They did away with her because there's too much truth in it. There is a super elite, super rich crowd running this world. And, and they want to create confusion, and, in order, and, by, and then by creating confusion, they'll bring order out of chaos. And that's what they intend to do, to create a new world order. So, the idea that you can blame the Jew for everything takes away the responsibility of all of us. Folks, you, might, you, 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 you may want to come along and blame the Jew for a lot of things. Well, you can blame Gentiles for a lot of things too. But here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. The people lapped it up, didn't they? Yeah. Nobody forced them. Nobody, nobody forced them. Nobody chained them and made them do anything. They loved it, and that's what they want, and that's what's happening today. That's why you see the culture in America going this way. And if you don't believe it, just take a good look at Indiana and what happened up there. When somebody that has a little, two little simple people with a pizzeria and a hypothetical situation, a hypothetical question was presented to them by a reporter, hypothetical, never had happened, and the reporter shoved that mic up underneath that girl's face and said, what would you do in such and such a case as it relates to homosexuals? And she says, well, we don't, we don't stop homosexuals. They're welcome to come to our business. But if we cater to them in a wedding or a reception or something, we feel like that we are participating and putting our approval upon it. Oh, boy, did a firestorm erupt. I'm telling you right now, she brought wrath down upon her. The, a, a lynch mob showed up at her door. And they began to scream bloody murder, so much for the First Amendment and so much for the freedom of speech. But the bottom line is, here's the worst part, it's not the lynch mob. It's not, those, it's not the rabid crowd brainwashed out there screaming in the streets that didn't know where they came from or where they're going. They have no idea that a person should have the freedom of conscience. That's freedom of religion, freedom of speech. That's what America is about, folks. I don't agree with everything that's said, but you've got a right to say it. Don't you believe that? Isn't that what we're about? Or is it about political correctness where you've got to be blinders on and you've got to believe everything that's spoon fed to you? You can't see anything different from that. But in any event, here's the greater point. The greater point is not only did this happen, but the greater point is that all of these businesses begin to chime in. They begin to chime in. The NCAA, uh, uh, Walmart, Apple. And I thought to myself, now let me understand this correctly, Walmart. At Christmas time, you make millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars and enrich yourself off of a Christmas holiday. Am I correct? I'm correct. And yet, you seized the opportunity to uh, demonize these two people who have a pizzeria up there in Ohio, or Indiana. Where is it? Indiana, Ohio? Where's Indiana. Indiana. Uh, do you see anything wrong with that? If they're going to be, now here, thing, here, here's the thing. If Walmart's going to be true to their convictions, they're going to shut their doors at Christmas time and say, no, wait a minute, we, we're not going to participate in this because we don't believe what Christians believe, and so forth and so on, right? It's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. Why? The two greatest truths in the Bible that apply to an unsaved man are these. These are the two greatest truths in all the Bible that apply to an unsaved man. These are the two greatest truths in the Bible that apply to an unsaved man. Skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin, for his flesh. Who said that? 
The devil. And it's 95% correct. Second one, the love of money is the root of all evil. You take those two verses right there and you've got 99% of every lost man walking the face of the earth. Am I right? You better believe it. <laughs> no question about it. So what does it mean, preacher? It means they have no convictions about anything. It's about their dollar bill and it's about their survival and their comfort and their, and their, and their, and their place in the world. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with what they believe. They don't believe anything. They believe, they believe in themselves, they love themselves, and they want to make money. Amen. See, that's a negative attitude. That's the truth, though. <laughs> that's exactly the way I see it. <laughs> So the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul said plainly that God is going to bring the Jew back. And he said in Hebrew, in, in, the, in Romans chapter number 11, they are the chosen people of God. Hath God cast away those which he foreknew? God forbid. So that puts Paul at odds with most of the religion of the world. Because you can see how the world's religion is headed right now when they've turned against Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, and all that's going on over there. All right, so he sets the place of the Jew. They hate Paul for that. He establishes the foundation of the gospel, Ephesians chapter number 6. Uh, when he confronted the Apostle Peter about the Judaizers and what was happening, you read about it in the book of Acts, they were being led astray. They were incorporating elements of Judaism into the gospel of grace. The Apostle Paul confronted him over that. And anyone else, the church at Galatia, he confronted over that because they tried to incorporate elements of Judaism into the Christian faith. Won't work, folks. Judaism is our tradition that we came from. The Lord's Supper was a product of the Passover, absolutely. But it's not the Passover. Christ is our Passover. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, a person becomes all of these things in the Old Testament that were places, that were events, that were festivals, that were days. All of these places and things in the Old Testament have now become a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing, he lays out the sequence of events relating to the second advent. And this, this is what I'm saying by this is the Apostle Paul is the one who tells you about the mystery of the rapture of the church of God. The mysteries, God revealed the mysteries to Paul. And these mysteries are, are what pull us together because they give us an identity that's separate from the world. Now, folks, here's, what, here's, here's where liberal, progressive liberal Christianity is headed. Progressive liberal Christianity is going down the road where, well, you know, we have a lot of good things in the Christian faith, but I'll tell you what, there's a lot of good stuff in the Hindu faith too. And there's a lot of good things over here in Buddha. You know, I mean, we can, we can appreciate that in the Muslim. So you've got Chrislam in the country now. What they're doing is losing their identity and their, and, their, and, their, and their real meaning of who they are. And the Apostle Paul made it plain. There's one Lord, Amen. one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So they hate Paul for that. Because this new religion, as I said to you a moment ago, this new religion is a synthesis. It's where they bring everything together. And then uh, a new religion uh, comes forth from it. So he unfolds the mysteries. The mysteries are very important. The mystery of the body of Christ, the rapture of the church of God, the incarnation, the blindness of Israel, and the mystery of iniquity. Then he reveals the dispensations. The dispensations as you find them in Luke 22. And let me give you this as a good example. This is a, this is a, this is a remarkable thing. Luke 22 verse 36. Luke 22, 36. Now, how many of you have ever heard anyone say, well, if they smite you on one cheek, turn the other? All right. Is there anything wrong with that? Socially, really not. When it comes to your social interaction with people, uh, allow yourself to be run over if necessary and, and whatever you can tolerate and put up with uh, for the witness of Christ. But there is a limit but now I want you to notice the scripture that's quoted, and then I'm going to use another scripture that's never quoted. And I want to show you how Paul, I want to show you this dispensation, how it applies to this. Look at Luke chapter number 22 and verse 36. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. And he, that hath a, and, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. 
and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Now hold your place there and go to Luke 6. Same Luke, chapter 6, verse 27. Luke chapter number 6 and verse 27. But I say unto you which I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despise, despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And this is what is called the golden rule. Verse 31, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Now, how do we reconcile a sword in turning the other cheek? See, see what happens here? How do we reconcile that? The Lord said, they came to him and said, here are two swords. He said, that's enough. All right, go buy a sword. That's enough. And yet, he said to Peter, put your sword up, for they that live with the sword will die with the sword. He cut off Malchus' ear. The Lord put it back on. How do we reconcile that? If you're not a dispensationalist, you begin to butt heads with some of the things in the Bible. So, what do you mean a dispensationalist? A dispensationalist is someone who believes that God during a certain period of time, time is so important, during a certain period of time He deals with mankind according to a certain standard or covenant or rule, and then after a certain period of time that changes and moves into another standard or period or rule. And for example, what we're living in right now is called the dispensation of the grace of God. Amen. That's what it's called. The dispensation of the grace of God. Where does this come from? This comes from Paul. Paul is instrumental, therefore, in laying out for us the idea that you have a period of time that you can, uh, that God deals with men, and then after that period of time, He changes the way He deals with men, and He has a reason for doing that. So now, during the time of the preaching of the of the Sermon on the Mount and the offering of the kingdom to Israel, he said, if he smites you on one cheek, turn the other. Let him smite that. Give him your cloak. Socially, it's a good thing for a Christian not to exert your rights and declare your place and position, but to try to be as meek as you possibly can with men and go along as much as you possibly can with men. And go the extra mile if necessary. But you are not commanded to do that now. He said, if you've got two swords, you've got enough. You pull out your sword. And what do you mean by that? You defend yourself if necessary. For example, your family. If a man kicks your door down, he comes in, he's going to take your wife and your children, he's going to rape your wife and steal your children and, and kill your sons and everything you got, what are you supposed to do? Pardon? You protect them. You protect them. What's happening here is the Lord is telling them, I'm sending you forth as sheep among wolves. And you need to understand that you've got to live in this world, but you don't have to be part of it. This is not that age of the kingdom gospel. That's a different story. And during the age of the kingdom gospel, things are entirely different in the way the Lord deals with men. Uh, for example, have you ever wondered about how in the book of Acts, during that transition period, God was so quick to smite people to death? What about Ananias and Sapphira? How many people have been guilty of doing the same thing they did? And yet when they walked in before Peter, they were smitten. Smitten? I mean, <laughs> right on the spot. They died. And of course it struck fear in the hearts of those people who were there. But the point is, the book of Acts is a transition book. It's a transition book from the age of the kingdom, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, into the gospel of grace. 
And if you look at the last chapter of the book of Acts, and this is a very important thing because it helps us to understand how things are changing. The last chapter of the book of Acts. In verse number 25, Acts chapter number 28, verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias, that's Isaiah, that's chapter number 6 he's quoting, the prophet unto our father, saying unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now there's a lot going on here, folks. Look at verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Had a Gentile been saved before this? Yes. Was Cornelius a Gentile? Absolutely. Acts 10? Certainly. So, it's not saying that now Gentiles can be saved. That's not what this is saying. It is saying now that the focus of the Gospel ministry is no longer toward the Jew, but it is toward the Gentile. Well, that's a big deal. Now, look at verse 28. Be it known therefore to you that salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. Now, where is he? Anybody could tell me where is he in his hired house? It's exactly right. He's in Rome. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him. Preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So, what happened here then, preacher? Well, here's what happened. God officially blinded the Jews. Now, that, breaks, that, that brings up a huge issue. Some of the questions that immediately come to mind. What do you mean He blinded them? Why did He blind them? How long will they be blinded? What will lift the blinding from their eyes? Where does the Jew stand today in the, in, the, in the sovereign province of God? What's going on here in Acts chapter number 28? All right. Here's the thing. If you are a dispensationalist, then you understand, all right, this is no longer the Sermon on the Mount and go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You remember when he said that to them? But this is now officially turning to the Gentiles. And by turning to the Gentiles, we've got a new thing happening here. And how long has that been? Well, so far to date it's been 2,000 years that he's turned to the Gentiles. You say that's a long time. That's two days with God. <laughs> two days. Think about one that's been forever, folks. Man's existence on this earth. The time we've been here. I was reading a thing the other day. I marvel at these guys. They talk about uh, they, they've dug up some bones out there in, in, uh, in uh, Arkansas, uh, uh, out west somewhere. They've dug up some bones, and immediately the paleontologist or whoever it was on the scene said, "Oh my goodness gracious, this is millions and millions and millions and millions of years old." I thought to myself, "Do you know anybody back then? <laughs> Did uh, you ever read anything where anybody uh, published something millions and millions and millions of years ago?" Of course, the idea is that they need all this time for this gradual evolving of the, of, of, you know, of creation to where it is today. But now, you ever thought about this? How big was Adam when God made him? Did he make a baby or did he make a full grown man? If you had checked Adam's DNA out at the moment that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul, you would have probably, in my estimation, I'd say 30 years old, because Adam was a type of Christ, and Christ was 30 when he entered on his public ministry. I'd put him at 30. You can't prove it, but I'd say 30. Well, that's 30 years. All right. Now, 30 years in the lifespan of a man is, 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 is uh, usually about half his age. Okay. 
In other words, if you had done all the analysis possible at the time and checked his flesh out, you'd say, good night, this man has lived for 30 years. Wait a minute, God just made him. A yeah. uh, soul. Yeah. Then he made him with age. <laughs> right? <laughs> then that means that when he created the universe, he could very well have created it if you had checked it at the time of the creation. It would have been millions and millions and millions and millions of years old, right? Yeah. right. Absolutely. I mean, as far as carbon-14 dating or whatever other method they use, the point I'm trying to make is that God could, He did create Adam with age. He could have created the universe with age, and you can call it however old you want to. I believe God made it, and I believe it came into existence, and I believe it came into existence exactly when He spoke it into existence. I can't nail down exactly the date to that, but I don't believe we've got quadrillion, zillion, billions, and billions of years. We don't need that. We've got, we've got a Creator that brought it into existence. You say, what about the dinosaurs, preacher? What about Paluxy River Valley down there in Glen Rose, Texas, where you've got dinosaur tracks and human tracks? You ought to read that sometime. Amen. You ought to read it. If you want to get a real, if you, want to, if you really want to get stirred up and have your blood start boiling, read, now here, let me say what it is, and then I'll get into this part. You've got a dinosaur track and you've got a human being running in the same strata. Same strata means on the same, the, the earth was the same at the time they were running. Uh, one wasn't running a, a million years later. They were running together at the same time. And then all of a sudden something covered them up and it froze their tracks in time. Now what could that be, you reckon? A universal flood. It's just like Atlantis. They say Atlantis. This, this advanced uh, root race men, uh, Atlantis, they, this advanced civilization that all of a sudden Atlantis was destroyed with a great flood. Where do you think that flood came from? They have evidence of a great flood all over the world. All right. Now, here's the problem though. The problem is that for generations they've taught that men and dinosaurs did not live together. They did not exist together. So that messes with their chronology. It messes with their, with their, with their system. So, you'd be amazed if you'll just do a little reading about what went on at Glen Rose, Texas, at all of these so-called scientists who are trying to say, oh, no, 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 those footprints are not in the same strata. And, and, and here's, one who, here, here's what one said. They said, well, now you know that in 1929 the stock market crashed. It did. And in 1933 uh, Franklin Roosevelt became the president. Did you know he became the president the same year that Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. 1933, all these years then until they got us into World War II, the country struggled and men did everything they could to make, to make ends meet, make a living, feed their families. And don't you know that some people went down there in Glen Rose, Texas, and they went down there and they planted all this stuff and they created all this mess down here so that they could sell this to people who'd come in there and see it. They created a tourist attraction. I have read where so-called reputable scientists have, 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 have accepted that theory of what happened in Glen Rose, Texas. Why? They'll believe anything but that almighty being up there who brought it into existence. So this thing at CERN, Switzerland, when they collide this, this Hadron Collider, when they collide these two elements together and something is produced from that, they are saying now, some of these scientists are saying that there's a possibility that they will open up a portal into a different uh, dimension. Dimension. That's one way to say it, a dimension. What's a dimension, you know? But they'll open up a portal into a different dimension and they don't know what will come out of it. I thought to myself, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you are an atheist, uniformitarianistic, materialistic. Uh, what's that term they used up there uh, uh, for the atheist? Uh, dialectic materialism, I think is the term. But anyway, if you're an atheist, you believe that material, that, that the material is it. That's it. That's the universe. Whatever's material. You do not believe in the existence of a soul or a spirit. See, the moment an atheist admits that there is a spirit, or a soul. Hold on. <laughs> the moment an atheist says, well, there could be a spirit or a soul. Wait a minute. God's a spirit. 
So you've completely undermined everything the atheist believes. So here's what's happening. In CERN, this thing's going to collide, and some of these scientists are saying, now you know we're messing around with something we don't need to be messing with here. Because we're liable to open up a dimension, and something's liable to come out of that, and we can't put it back in. And something's liable to come out of that thing that's not like anything we have ever known. I'd do some serious thinking if I were an atheist, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Say money was involved. Well, sure they did. Sure they did. They wanted to put Lazarus. Listen, they wanted to put they wanted to put Lazarus to death after he'd been raised from the dead. Yes, sir. Oh, it's a sovereign state inside Switzerland. Right. They have their own, they, yeah, their own government. Right outside of Geneva. Okay. Right where that plane flew over and disappeared, you know, I, Yeah. Or, but, you know, they didn't have the right to do that. And they turned it on the last time. The people in the community were reporting seeing things coming up out of the ground. Uh-oh. This thing is 100 meters under the earth. Are you hearing this? It's 17 miles around. <laughs> You know the most remarkable thing I think about it, did you hear what he said about the fact that uh, before they turned this thing off before what happened caused it to go off, but anyway, that the people that lived in the community around this thing in Switzerland said that while this thing was going on that something was coming up out of the ground, spirits or some kind of spirit entities uh, coming up out of the ground, the people that lived around there. Uh, now they're, they've started, they're, they're going to start it up again. Right, they've already started it up. But it's not, it hasn't reached full potential or whatever it is. It is they've got a date set for something on this. It is turned on. The, uh, the thing about the, the goddess that he's talking about, this Hindu goddess, yeah. is, is Shiva. Jesus. Isn't it Shiva? Yeah. I think it is. Surrounded by a ring of fire. Yeah. And this guy looks like some kind of a, I don't know, half woman, half man looking thing. Yeah, androgyny. They're big on that. And when he dances, he creates, but he's also known. Yeah. And that's yeah. what the that's what tradition means. Yes. So this thing is very satanic and it's it's everything about it is very satanic. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that an atheist that says there is no God is worried about what's liable to come out of something? Yeah. <laughs> think about that for a minute. <laughs> right. If you're so cocksure that there's no spirit world, you know, that there's nothing out there except the the physical what are you worried about? All that could come out of it is physical. Right? And what if a spirit did come out of it? Pastor, yes. There's so many things going on right now to, to say that Jesus Christ is coming back soon. Yes, sir, brother. I firmly believe that. I mean, Christians ought to be excited. They ought to be praising the Lord. They Amen. Start praying for their lost loved ones. They ought to really get serious. Amen. Amen. One day we're going to be standing in front of him giving, giving an account of what we did for him. Yes, sir, brother. Folks, just give a, just think about Almighty God, yes. that yes. eternal being. And we 
have to account to him. And all that creation will ever know of him is what he reveals himself to them. You can't find him. You can't find out to find him. If he doesn't reveal it, you'll never know it. And there's only one that can take you to the Father. <laughs> That's the Son. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so glad. Glory to God. I'm saved today. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. And we'll start up again here in a few minutes. Brother Lee, will you just.